Absolutely. I'm just going to get up here this screen. Da -da -da. Let me see if I can get it going here. Window. There we go. It's just a little bit slow. Okay. And are you all able to see that now? Yes. Beautiful. Okay. Oh, and we're going to go jumping ahead, I think, here. So we hit present and it jumps ahead on me. So my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rob, for that lovely introduction, too. Uh, my heart was really happy hearing that, <laughs> so thank you. Um, my name is Melissa. I'm assistant professor at Cape Breton University, um, and I primarily teach in literacy and literacy instruction and in the earlier years. So I've kind of laid out an agenda, and in the interest of time, I'm going to cut it down a little bit. Um, a lot of the pieces Lynn has spoke to um, align nicely with what I'm doing in terms of my research as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about me, um, where my focus is, what the research tells us, and those barriers and potentials and then open it up for questions. So for me, I'm a former teacher and that's sort of where I come from. My heart is within teaching in the early years and leveraging technology. So I've always sort of lived in that space. Um, so the current project that I'm really excited and I'm working on is looking at kindergarten and elementary teachers' narratives of curriculum and UDL in virtual learning environments. And this sort of came about with COVID and that quick pivot, one of those favorite words of the time, um, to that online learning piece and what teachers were saying and how it was going. And so part of that comes from some of my master's research where I looked at leveraging um, virtual learning environments and digital technologies in Indigenous language revival. So I've always sort of had this stream coming through. Um, so my research interests look at uh, critical literacy, narrative inquiry, and that virtual learning piece. And so with that, um, I always like to start out with that narrative sort of piece of me um, and UDL. So it's not that one size fits all, right? And it's not sort of blending it all together. It's recognizing those challenges, naming them, highlighting them, celebrating and designing for them. And I think that's that key piece, right? Really designing for the, the needs of the whole. Um, and so Katie Novak, that's one of my favorite quotes about UDL. So I thought I'd share that today. Um, and so with the UDL in the early years, we're looking at those multiple means of representation of the content, but then the expression part by students. And that's where I really lived in um, when I was teaching online with three, four and five year olds. And so part of what came out of this research, um, when I started talking to teachers, they were seeing some of the same issues that I was seeing and what the research was telling us that um, with younger learners navigating and having that navigational support in a virtual learning environment was really tricky. Um, and given that they were so young, an adult needed to be present all the time, right? And, and it's very different than in the physical classroom where I could walk over and sort of hand over hand and help them with that. Um, access to the reliable Wi-Fi, hardware, software, um, and then just technical knowledge in general. So not only were teachers telling me when I was looking at this research that they had to learn all of this technology, and sometimes it was changed partway through the year. So for an example, one of my teachers that I had, I had these interviews with said, you know, we started out with Google Meets and then all of a sudden halfway through the year I had to teach my students how to use Teams and so we've you know we've got these students using it I'm comfortable with it and now we're switching and so that came up as a barrier um, because we think about teachers teaching content and that mandated uh, those mandated curricular outcomes now they have sort of this other curriculum coming at them that they have to teach to. And they found that that was really challenging and a barrier to what they could do with those online pieces. Um, and so that's when I started working with school boards um, and, and a few other um, EAs and other agencies to look at how can we pull that TPAC. And so TPAC is the technological knowledge pedagogy or technology pedagogy and content knowledge. So how those pieces can all come together and we can really create a really nice virtual learning environment where students can learn learn. Um, part of the other barriers that came out of this research were well-being and screen time, right? So the synchronous, the live sort of what we're doing now and those asynchronous, what you might do in sort of Moodle posts and things like that. Um, and balancing those times were different for younger learners. And so in particular, because my research is, is um, situated in Ontario, there were two sort of different time frames that our Ministry of Education put out. So if students were in kindergarten, like the students I was teaching, they had a less 
lesser amount of time online than students in grade one to eight. So 180 minutes compared to 225 minutes of sort of this face to face to face in the virtual sphere. Um, and that was really tough for young learners and tough for teachers. Um, when I was listening to those stories um, throughout their interviews, it was difficult to sort of manage that because younger learners were really tired right away. So how can we build in those pieces to give them those breaks, give them those sort of pauses, look at chunking that uh, the work down for them and organizing our days a little bit differently. One of the pieces too that had come out of this is when I started talking to teachers and to parents is that in the virtual sphere, um, we think about UDL, we think about that whole approach. Well, part of that is also looking at social work and ABA specialists and occupational therapists. That looked very different online if we had access to it at all. Um, and so having students being able to engage in the virtual sphere was different if they required support of say a hearing support educator or an ABA specialist who's not in that physical space with them and so that kind of fits in with what Lynn was talking about what's needed for those students as well um, and then in terms of literacy because this is where it's sort of where I where I live my my area um, those phonetical challenges. So when we're teaching younger students to read, we're getting them to form the letters with the mouth and they have to say it and enunciate it. But if there's a break in um, in Wi-Fi access, if there's a lag, if there's something um, sort of with technology that's not working, then students who might have already been at a disadvantage uh, in terms of learning those literacy pieces now have that whole other challenge on top of that. So what does that mean in terms of positive because there are a lot of barriers that are coming out here when i started pulling pieces um, of the research um and so we'll talk about those positives in a minute but one of the big things that came up over and over again and i've kind of left this as this last point here is in terms of udl really um teachers struggled with getting parents to understand the concept of udl and allowing their child to struggle a little bit, right? Because par as parents, and if you're a parent, you want your child to be successful. You want them to, to read that word you want. So you're getting a lot of prompting, right? So then that made it difficult for educators to get a really good, accurate assessment. And then if that child, say, needed those supports later on, they may not necessarily have access to that because they're showing their scores are really great. Mom and dad are helping them out, right? So all these pieces, um, educators were coming to me and talking about and saying, okay, I would love to do UDL, but here's this laundry list of, of things that I'm struggling with. And so when we started to dig into it and I started to work more with teachers in the school boards, I asked them to flip it on the positive side. So let's look at the positives of what you're doing right now in your learning environment to support young learners, because we know they need a lot of explicit instruction and a lot of visual support. So all those pieces that Lynn spoke to, come right into this part as well. And so you'll see, I'm going to, I'm going to just go back for a second um, in terms of expression, right? Um, so students who wanted to express, they had options and this is a positive too, right? They could write for those students who are ready to write and it's in French. So apologies if you don't read or speak French, but this was a child who was working on her French immersion piece. Um, we were talking uh, about Ruby Bridges during Black History Month. So she was writing this up. Someone else had drawn a picture and then I have another child down here who had the support of parents who was looking at um, Black scientists for Black History Month. And so they each had a way to express their knowledge. And I said to the said to teachers, you know, this is a great way. You have all these multimodal pieces of expression, but you've also given them, whether you've realized it or not, different ways to access that content, whether it's reading a book, whether it's a video, whether it's, you know, just a conversation and discourse. So the, there are things that you are doing. Yes, we have barriers, but let's look at these positives, right? So um, one of the interview, the teachers I interviewed came out and said, well, I have, you know, a class of very active learners. And in the virtual sphere, I have a little, a little guy who has a trampoline and he needs to move constantly. So when he's on his screen, he's bouncing up and down on his trampoline to get his energy out, but he's still focusing, right? Sometimes we'll 
ask, she says, sometimes we'll ask him to shut off his camera so it's not distracting for others, but I know he's still there. I know he's still learning. That might be different in that physical classroom, right? Because he was a, he was a boy, she said, who liked to hum and to sing and to do all these things. But this was a great way for him to still engage with the content, to still move his body like he needed to, and really not distract his other peers, right? So those peers who might need just that direct focus, I need to, you know, really hone in on what's on the screen in front of me and not worry about what's around me. They could do that while he was jumping and singing on his trampoline and focusing, right? So that was a really nice piece. We also talked about, um, and I touched on this a bit, those multimodal means of expression. So here, these are all within the same math lesson. They're talking about adding groups of tens and groups of ones. And so we have two children with whiteboards at their home. These are actually twins. <laughs> so we have that same table there. Um, but so they're able to do the adding piece that way. These two, we were learning um, about tree week at this point in time, the teacher had told me. So they were creating groups of 10 to make wampum belts. So they counted her beads in groups of 10. And then so they they were able to just do things in a different way. Um, and Lynn, I'm, I'm going to talk to this persistence piece too, because Lynn kind of touched on that. Um, one of the things that came out with our younger learners is, yes, frustration because they couldn't find, you know, the unmute button or the, the video button or you're going into breakout groups. How do I get there? And, and so what came out of this was, okay let's really work on our social emotional learning and so let's persist what can we do when technology isn't doing what we want we can be frustrated for sure but what are our next steps and so teachers really reported that those persistence levels started to increase for those younger learners because they wanted to get it they wanted to do what their peers are and they noticed the collaboration really started to increase as well in their classrooms in their virtual classrooms because one student might say oh I know a trick to that. I you can do a shortcut. You can do it. So they they started to use students as another sort of and I, and I I hesitate on saying this, but as a tool, as a co-teacher, right? So they were learning from peers as well, which gives that other entry point. Um, part of what uh, educators also reported in this research was the subtitles and using sign language translators to really engage students were really helpful. Um, some students that were about five or six really had excellent decoding skills, so the subtitles were great for them. Um, and then for parents too who were helping out, so if there was a lag, parents could jump in and say, oh, I see the subtitles, this is what happened, now I can support. Um, and then having, um, in terms of UDL, recording was really important. Um, so a lot of our educators said, you know, I would record at all day, every day almost. So with the permission of parents, um, we would record that. They could see our day, they could see our lessons, and if they were stuck or if there was homework, they could go back again and re-watch that lesson and re-sort of group it, see those questions and hear those questions again. Um, so that was a really great way to engage with students as well. Um, and then this is something, this was something that was new to me that a teacher brought up in one of our interviews through the research. And she had talked about pairing hearable hearing aids with the individual audio sources. So almost like we would have like our earbuds for our iPods and that, they could pair these audio sources and there's a trick to it. And I I'm, I'm meeting with this teacher next week so I can report back to Rob. <laughs> Maybe Rob knows a little bit more about this than I do. Um, but they could pair with what was going on in the lesson, but they could also pair like with the switch of a click of a button or a switch, pair with another device that would sort of give them that, that, uh, that repeat or whatever happened to be going on there. So it was really a really interesting topic that she had started talk, talking about. So I'm sort of excited to hear more about how this pairing hearables um, would work. And that came out of this research. Um, so that was an exciting learning piece for me as well. Oh, there we go. And so as this research starts to, and I say wrap up very loosely because there is so much more that can come out of this, um, some of the pieces, the three key pieces that really started to come out of this research were um, meeting the needs of students who are immunocompromised. Um, so I can speak to this personally. Um, when I was teaching online, I had a student who was attending doctor's appointments for leukemia treatment. And so it was really great. She could listen in, she could follow along, she could do uh, with the class while she's sitting there with her iPad. And what was 
awesome is the nurses eventually started to come into our lessons. And so she'd, she'd turn and share and the nurses would say good morning. And then we would learn about things that were happening in the hospital, what the nurses are doing, what this looks like. So that just sort of pulled in a whole nother level of learning, but it also created a classroom community for this particular student. Um, because she had been so removed for so long in her studies, um, this was a great way for her to connect. Um, and then work and sport came out of this research too. So a lot of children who are engaged in acting or extracurricular activities that are um, competitive sport perhaps, could access um, content at any time, could access the uh, the VLE and still be a part of that classroom community. So that was really important as well. And that really connects right into this rural and remote uh, learners. And then the language revival piece, which is still sort of sitting in my in my research portfolio, right? Those keeping those connections to the home community and to um, to indigenous speakers. And so I'm just I'm going to flip back because I know we're very close on time here um, just so I can see my screen there. There we go. Um, but that was another really important piece that came out is connecting those further, those further out in the community and making that connection um, together. And so what I'll do is I will pause there. I know I've kind of ran through super quickly, um, but I know we all have time is precious for everyone. Um, so I will pause um, and I'll stop sharing and come back to you and see if there are any questions or comments or thoughts, or I can turn it over to Rob as well and open the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa, and uh, so many great lessons uh, out of those experiences. Now, I know uh, both Lynn and Melissa have been talking about things in the context of a K-12 classroom, especially mm -hmm. uh, in Melissa's case with, with younger students, and in Lynn's case with uh, students with, uh, with different accessibility issues. But a lot of the lessons learned from this uh, apply universally. They, they benefit all learners, not just uh, those with accessibility needs. I always come back to that uh, to that one little graphic that I love to share of the kid in the wheelchair at the bottom of the ramp on a snowy day. It's like, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it these lessons learned can be of huge benefit to everyone. Uh, 